Welcome to the Self Seeker channel. Today, I have the pleasure of having Lisa Parker join us. Lisa is the founder of Trilom Academy. She is also a body worker. And today we are going to learn more about her and the work she does. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, thanks, Nick. It's such a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. So you're based in L.A. I am. I'm in California. Um, I've been there since the beginning of 2019. And um, it was just where I was called to start my practice. You know, I graduated from a university, not a university, but a school in Colorado. And at the time, I was doing a bunch of studies in the plant medicine world. And I found myself in Peru for two months. And I thought for sure I was going to go back and set up my practice in Colorado. Um, but while I was in the jungle, it was very clear I was supposed to go to Los Angeles. And so I changed my return ticket and landed there. And I stayed in, in California for about another month or so before just with my backpack that I had in the jungle before I finally went back to Colorado and packed up my stuff and I moved it. So it was where I was meant to be to start my practice. I see. So you work um, with plants. Mm -hmm. So medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. I see. So is that what led to the formation of Trilome? It was a combination of things. So I started working with psychedelics for my own personal healing journey. I was in one of those moments where um, after 35 years of having no therapy or talking to anyone about my life experiences or my trauma, I knew that it was time for me to finally ask for help. And um, with my introverted, sensitive nervous system, the idea of going and finding a human, like a psychotherapist, to talk to about my innermost, you know, sensitive places in my heart just seemed it wasn't going to work, you know, because I am very happy in silence. So if you want to, you know, <laughs> I'll go and sit in silence for an hour, no problem. And with my level of disassociation also, I wasn't actually in tune or in touch with my life experiences. So I don't even know that talk therapy would have been the right thing. Um, but I didn't know what else to do. Um, my sister-in-law had been telling me about ayahuasca. And she kept referring to it as a therapeutic thing. And before then, you know, I grew up in a very conservative Christian background and I was an athlete all the way through university. And so psychedelics were going to ruin my life, ruin my career, shame my family, send me straight to hell. <laughs> and so I didn't just, I just didn't give them any type of thought. But I remembered her talking about ayahuasca as being therapeutic and I, you know, I, so I asked her a little bit more about it. Can you tell me more about this therapeutic thing that you keep telling me about? Um, and I know she probably did a wonderful job of explaining it to me, but the only thing I actually really heard was that I'm not supposed to talk to anyone. And so I was thinking in my head, oh, I can go drink a plant, not talk to anyone, stay in silence for eight hours. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds perfect. And so I think it's a good thing that I didn't fully understand the the gravity and the the size of an ayahuasca ceremony because I don't know that my nervous system would have let me go. And so I think it was good that I I went in it kind of blind to what the experience was going to be. Um, you know, and they say that one night with these medicines can equate to years of psychotherapy. And for me, that was so true. You know, again, because of the level of disassociation, because of my trauma and my nervous system and my life experiences, you know, I don't know that I would have been able to talk some of these like really complex things through with another human being. And that that one ceremony I mean, it didn't even touch my trauma, right? It was just, you've been hiding all over your life. You know, it's time to come out from hiding and, you know, your path was forward. And it was this, you know, initial understanding of, oh, wait a second, I have issues. Like, that's not how life is supposed to be. I had just convinced myself that I was going to be miserable and, 
you know, not have a future. And, you know, it was the first time that I really felt hope, you know, that I do have a future, you know, and it is, has nothing to do with my past, you know, that, that everything forward, you know, I can let the past go. I don't have to walk backwards to make sure all of my demons stay there. You know, I can let those go and walk forward. And after that first initial night, you know, again, we didn't even touch my trauma, but it was enough for me to go, oh, okay, this, this is the level of support that I need. And so I started sitting as often as I could because I had this like very um, kind of urgent need to heal as quickly as I could because I knew that there was something for me on the other end. And so I was working with psychedelics and at the same time, I ended up enrolling in a, in a bodywork school. Um, so I was switching professions from the big corporate world into body work. And it was so interesting to me what I was going through in these ayahuasca ceremonies, like as I was unraveling my life, my challenges, my traumas, and like the lessons that I was learning. And then as I was receiving body work from my school, what my body was processing. And I was like, wait a second. Like it was the first time that it really kind of dawned on me that my my physical tissue had been holding on to some of these life memories as well. And so I started getting curious about what the body holds and I got introduced to the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And it was such an eye-opening experience of, of course my body is also holding memories of my life experiences. And of course my psyche and my my spirit and my emotions are, are working with the psychedelics, but there was such a symbiotic um, partnership between the two because that's how I was healing myself and I was seeing the partnership. Um, and so that's just kind of, I think that's just how it started for me was I knew I needed to do both at the same time. And that's what led me on to this, this path of how do I, how do I do this for other people? I see. Thank you. What was your situation prior to that? Had you seen a few therapists? Were you seeking help? No, nothing. Nothing. So I learned how to disassociate from the time I was seven because um, I have a very sensitive nervous system and everything was so overwhelming and I just didn't have the tools to know how to talk about what I was experiencing, both energetically and emotionally and even physically. And um, I just learned how to lock everything in. And so I've, thankfully, my home life, I mean, I do believe I grew up in a haunted house. I mean, there were, the house that I lived in terrified me. But as far as my family unit goes, my parents are wonderful. My siblings are wonderful. I mean, I fought with my brother. Like, let's just be, you know, clear about that. I mean, there was like typical sibling rivalry. Um, but the energies in the house terrified me. And then I you know, a huge amount of bullying through school and then being in situations where I just like was physically unsafe. And I just never talked about it because I was so shy and I was so introverted and I was so overwhelmed that when you disappear, you know, you're not in tune with your emotions or you don't know how to handle anything. And so, you know, my, my family and my parents had no idea that anything was happening. And so I went through life, I went through a lot of trauma, some of it violent. And, um, you know, I've had surgeries that my parents don't know about it. Um, they may be hearing about it now. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I went through years and years and years of trauma and abuse and violence and never said a word, never said wow. a word. Okay. It just didn't, it never occurred to me to say anything. And I think there was a lot of kind of self-inflicted guilt and shame around it. Like somehow it was my fault. Um, my responsibility, my fault. I should have known better type stories that we tell ourselves and that we pick up from society based on hearing how other people talk about things. And you don't ever want to be that and the last thing that I wanted was like let's say I do come forward with some type of my trauma to suddenly have everyone looking at me in my most vulnerable place yeah. just wasn't an option that makes sense yeah I understand yeah how much of it would have to do with the conditioning that young girls are brought up with that you got to be a good girl 
I think it, um, for me more so, it was the religious upbringing. Because everything is shameful and everything is bad and you're bad and you sin and you confess. And, you know, it's always a, it's always a short falling, like we were born sinners type of a thing, you know, that we need salvation and uh, being a, a natural people pleaser, you know, this idea that, you know, I would disappoint someone, you know, let alone God. I remember my first boundary crossing as it was happening. I was staring, I was disassociating. I was on my way out. Um, the only thing I really truly remember is I was looking at the ceiling and the only thing going through my head was God must be so disappointed in me. And I was the one that was, <laughs> you know, that was being abused, but that was just the conditioning in my head. And, you know, I just wasn't taught how to handle things or how to talk about things or how to confront things. And, you know, even with my nervous system, I don't know that talking to someone, I don't know that I could have handled that anyway. You know, I think I was just born into this life really sensitive and I didn't, I didn't know how to handle that except to just shut it down. Yeah. So as a sensitive person, how did it feel to receive massage or body work and what was what was the experience for you that was some of the hardest training i've ever gone through i have never liked massage because being passive on a table as someone else touched me was a massive trigger it's the furthest thing from relaxation that i could think of um so yeah i never i it's just the one thing that I never sought out. I never got massage, I never got body work. And so when I found this particular program that I went into and realized that this was the type of, of therapeutic work that I wanted to do, um, because of my athletic background, I've had a lot of injuries and I know what it's like to help someone, you know, feel good in their body. And this was the first time that I felt like, oh, this is like, I'm touching someone with a purpose, not just someone off the street, so they feel good and then leave, you know, like that just didn't resonate with me. Um, yeah, so that was really the first time that I let people touch me. And it was, you know, every afternoon, uh, five days a week for about a year. And that was, that was very challenging. Because <laughs> I had a lot to process, you know, I had a lot to process through my body. I had to learn um, but then I also had to receive and it was just, I think that's a huge part of my sensitivity now when I'm working with people is understanding the vulnerability um, that they go through or that I'm asking them to go through by being on my table. And that's what actually spurred me to get to seek out therapy or seek out help for the first time because I had that intuition. I didn't really understand what it was, right? Because I didn't have that that maturity yet. Um but if I was going to ask someone to lay on the table and to trust me and for me to hold that space as, as firmly and as um, safely as I could, I knew that I needed to get myself together. And that's, that's really what, what spurred the conversation with my sister on Alaska is, you know, I, for me to be a good practitioner, I need to go do my own work. And that's what spurred it on. Thank you. Do you believe that plant medicine, we can be specific, ayahuasca, for example, it calls to us? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, that's a really good question. I do. I. When you work with these medicines in a therapeutic context, you have to be ready to do your work. These sacred plants, when you go through these experiences, they don't just automatically change your life for you. They give you the tools and they give you the insight, but you have to have the courage to go in and do your own work. Uh, it's not a magic pill. And so not everyone is ready. And I feel like once people get to that place where they're ready to take responsibility for their lives and to do that type of, of deep, you know, introspective work, um, that's when they sense that calling, you know, for a, a specific plant or a specific type of therapy. 
I see. So could you give us a general overview of what the trilome process is like? Yeah, so trilome is the is the method that combines psychedelic and body work together. And so a session typically lasts about five hours. And so as soon as a client walks through my door, I spend a lot of time sitting with them. Um because it's, I'm not just working with their, their present day self, but it's also their nervous system and then their, their inner child, if you will. And so their present day self may feel confident, but the nervous system may feel a little uncertain. And we get very good at bypassing the nervous system and just saying, I know this is good for me and I'm going to do it, you know, but in this type of context that actually doesn't serve us, because I don't believe you know, our protective systems and the sensitivities on our nervous systems are there for a reason. And so to bypass them or to ignore them is just reinforcing the patterns that get things stuck in our system to begin with. And so as a client comes in, I sit with them to make sure that we, you know, I give their system, their nervous system predictability. I explain the whole process and that they feel settled. And when all parts of them feel ready is when we start. Um, I give a small dose of medicine, um, so it's not a full medicine journey because I want the client to stay fully present with what's happening in their body. So I would give what they would call a threshold dose. It's more than a microdose. I want them to feel it, but it's not enough to fully disassociate and, you know, do the deeper introspective work. And from there, um, I lead them through, it's essentially about a four hour process of, you know, the clients stay fully dressed, first of all, and I often work over a blanket as well. Um, the hands-on work is just really slow, sustained pressure, kind of directing the energy and the attention. And so I find places of conflict or tension or stress, or especially if there's chronic pain. And um, so the client will go in and work with the medicine to figure out, okay, what are they holding? Is it even theirs? And how did it get there? And what does it need for healing and release? And as they go through those deeper energetic and emotional processes with the medicine, I can feel their tissue start to shift and change. So then I, I support it with the hands-on work. And we just slowly kind of go through the body and just bring everything back into balance. And then after the session, um, yeah, I spend some time in like grounding and processing and integrating and making sure that, you know, that the next steps in self-care are really clear. Um, and then traditionally, you know, within a week or so, I would have the longer follow-up conversation because the integration is really important. You know, it's one thing to have a really cool experience, but we do this so it informs your life going forward in a way that is helpful and supportive. And in the moment, life can feel very clear. There's a clear understanding of, oh, I'm not going to take on that person's trauma and I'm going to take care of my body and everything feels like it makes sense. And then you go back onto life. You go back to kids and partners and family and in-laws and, and careers and neighbors and all of the stresses. And some, sometimes, you know, that, you know, what's deeply felt in the session sometimes gets lost or a little bit confused. And so, you know, the integration is a really big part of the process. As a client, is it required for them to believe in plant medicine or even in body work for it to be a success? I think their only belief that they need to have coming in is that healing is possible, that shifts can happen. And that there is a deeper connection to their own being that can happen and that resolution can be found. How that happens in their belief, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not really sure. I would assume that if someone is called to this work, then they already see the value of the psychedelics and the body work. Um, but whether they believe or not, it's going to help if they come through my door and if they believe that healing is possible and if they, they're seeking that they want to feel good in their body and they want to live well in all aspects. Um, that's all I would really require of them. And what if people have um, fears or insecurities about plant medicine and what would possibly happen as a result of consuming plant medicine? What would you say to them? Fair enough. <laughs> 
there's a lot of confusion and questions around psychedelic medicines right now and plant medicines. Um, there's a lot of articles being written, you know, scientific articles and case studies, you know, that proclaim the, the incredible therapeutic effects. Um, but then people are watching it happen in real life with people who maybe don't have the, the right training to serve. And so that gets confusing when they're watching people have experiences that um, don't quite add up to what they hear. And then you have people that are using uh, sacred plant medicines and psychedelics uh, recreationally, and which can be beautiful, you know, but then you hear of people having a hard time and, and like scary trips or bad trips. And so of course that's confusing because like, who do you believe in all of this? <laughs> And so I welcome those questions and I welcome those fears. And this is where I spend a lot of time talking to everyone going, those concerns and fears are there for a reason because you've experienced something or you've heard something or you've talked to a friend who had a negative experience. So what is it that you are concerned about? And let's give honor to that. And then let's actually talk about, okay, scientifically like what are psychedelic medicines how do they work on the brain how do they work on the body you know let's let's go back to fact and then let's talk about safety in my sessions here's how i here's how i handle the medicines here's how i dose here's what happens if you're uncomfortable here's what happens if um uh you're not comfortable with whatever is happening you know, it's giving information, you know, and a lot of people don't have access to that type of conversation. Someone that's experienced and trained, you know, in these medicines who can answer those questions. Okay, so what is psilocybin? What is MDMA? What is ayahuasca? When would I go do ketamine over psilocybin? You know, the that information, you know, unless you're tapped into a community, who would you ask those questions to? And so I make myself available for those questions because I think people need to be informed in education, especially now because I'm seeing a lot of, well, I won't go there. I think education is important. Yes. And um, what are some of the qualities that people should look for when they're trying to find a facilitator who can help them in this area? Talk to them have a conversation. Who do they train with? What is their experience level? And then you look for, you know, how people are presenting themselves. You know, I have a strong, my own personal belief, right? Don't take this as, as any kind of anything other than my own opinion. Um, people that proclaim themselves as gurus or shamans, unless you are originating from an indigenous tribe or have lived and served and apprenticed under an indigenous person, unless you can clearly state that you can go into the spiritual realm and advocate for your client in that realm because you have such a deep relationship with the plant, don't call yourself a shaman. There's a lot of people who are seeing an opportunity for that guru status and for power and um, you know it's really I, I just I find that really unfortunate but um you want to ask them questions about like what's their intake process you know do they check the medical records you know what's the level of support what's the integration uh what happens if you get uncomfortable in a session like what are their policies in place um, you want to know who you're sitting with, you know, not just, you know, someone that you figured out served medicine. I think the best referral is like when you know someone that has sat with them and there's a little bit of a um, known experience, you know, with the with the person who's facilitating. Um, but education experience, you know, and their their respect for the medicine and how they hold it, you know, is it just a spiritual party? You know, or is there ritual? You know, is there, are there prayers offered to the indigenous people of the land? You know, how do they speak about their medicines? Do they know, do they know what they're serving and how to interact with them and what the spirit, you know, that comes from them are? 
you know, if you hear someone talk about their medicine, typically those that are really um, called to it have this magic about them when they speak about it and you're drawn in. Um, and those are the things that I that I look for. And one thing that my partner says over and over again, which I, I find very true, is, you know, if you want to know if a teacher is enlightened, look at their assistant. If their assistant isn't enlightened, then run. So how is it that they treat the people around them? The, the people that serve with them, the land that they're on? You know, if there's a level of respect around the people around them, that gives you uh, some good insight. If the people around them are tired and exhausted and broken and, you know, take heed. Got it. And um, what can happen when you have a session with someone who is not properly trained? What can go wrong? That's a very big question. <laughs> Just curious. There's a big responsibility for holding a space when you are ushering people into working with medicines that are leaving them open and vulnerable. By nature of working with the medicines, you're asking for the control systems to soften. You're asking for those deeper insights into your own psyche and higher self. But the, the veil between the energetic and spiritual world gets thinner. And I do believe that there's a spiritual world out there. And I do believe that there's um, there are other things outside of humans that we can in, we can interact with. And I say that because I know that I have my teachers, my guides, you know, there are those, those, you know, intuitive, intellectual, spiritual things that I don't tangibly see, but I know that are there that guide me. And so if they're there, then I know that there are other things present. And when someone is creating that container and opening that space, and they're not holding it well, then when someone is open and vulnerable, the chances of, um, of them having challenging experiences and getting hurt is heightened. Now, what that looks like is going to be different for people. You know, it depends on everyone's sensitivity. Um, but imagine, you know, imagine walking into a room that you think is safe. And so you put all of your armor down and all of your weapons down and you walk in naked and vulnerable and it ends up being unsafe and you have no way to defend yourself. Um, I mean, not only physically, but emotionally and energetically and spiritually, it can be incredibly harmful. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. I have heard of the term massage before, but body work, that's new to me. So could you please tell us the difference? Mm -hmm. The biggest difference between body work and massage, massage uh, will typically refer to a specific routine. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a big umbrella with massage and there's deep tissue and Swedish and stone and Thai. And typically all of those follow the exact same routine. So if you get a, um, a deep tissue or a sports massage, um, you're, you know, you can go anywhere in the world and get that type of massage and you're going to have a very similar experience. Um, body work typically doesn't have that set routine. It's more specific to, you know, the, the client in particular. So it's about how everything in the body is connected, how all of the, the fascia and the fascia layers in the body are connected. Uh, so body work will look at like where the pain point is and, you know, the connection above and below that pain point, understanding that you can have pain in your shoulder, but it may not stem from your shoulder. It could be a misalignment in your neck or, or the misalignment in your hips that's pulling you know, your, your back that's like straining your, your shoulder, you know, there's a, you know, a couple different things. Um, and so body work understands that. And so, yes, they're going to treat the shoulder, but they're also going to look above and below, you know, to see like where the alignments are, where the restrictions are, um, kind of going through 
it's like myofascial release. So, you know, all the different fascial layers of the body. So massage, it feels good. It's for relaxation. It can do, it can be very therapeutic and it can be very healing. Um, but the type of massage is going to be the same. You know, your body work is going to be different wherever you go and whoever you work with. I see. So I'm guessing there's a level of healing that happens after a session of trilome. Mm -hmm. Do do you see people needing another session usually after one session is done? So far, no. And I've been doing this for five years now. Um, and I say that because not that there there won't be follow up sessions. The point of trilome is to uncover what we're holding in our bodies. And a lot of that is part of the autonomic nervous system. It's just, which is the nervous system that runs the automatic functions of our body, heart rate, digestion, circulation, breath and blinking. Although we can tap into those, we don't have to, but that's the nervous system that runs our reflexes. So like how we flinch if we think something's coming at us or my favorite when our arms like fling in crazy directions when we're falling, you know, we're not cognitively doing that. It's just our body just naturally knows. Yeah. And so that reflex, like when we, when we tense to protect ourselves, um, you know, we go through life where there's a threat or conflict and we'll, we'll flinch and we'll relax, but maybe not all the way. And then life happens and then we get through, we relax, but maybe not all the way. And so before we know it, we have all of this tension that we didn't even realize was there. Yeah. So a trilome session will go through and kind of help the client realize and really understand like what their body is holding. Um, so there's pretty, pretty often, if not all the time, there's a pretty direct understanding around, oh, this is the, you know, abandonment from my mother, or, you know, this is the stress from my job, or, you know, this is because I don't feel safe in my relationship, you know, whatever it may be. Now, most people are able to work through that. I won't say most people. There's a potential to be able to work through those complicated things in the moment and find complete resolution. Um, but then there are times when, you know, it's like, you know, an abandonment from a mother, like might be a really complex thing for someone to work through, but at least they know what it is. So after a trial session, now they can go to their therapist. Now they know what they're working with. So there's potential for resolution within one session, but if not, there's there's an obvious understanding of what they're holding, and then they can go do their work with their therapist or through what other therapeutic modality they choose. Um, so does someone need more than one trilum session? I mean, for maintenance and for layers, because as long as we're humans, having a human experience, we're never going to be done <laughs> with our healing and evolution. And so, you know, I do have clients that'll come in like maybe twice a year, or if they're really struggling with something, or, you know, if they, like a new chronic pain point pops up, but they don't know what it, you know, and they want to know what it is, they'll call me for a session. Um, but this isn't something I would never sell like a five pack and say, you have to come see me five times. Because I don't, I don't believe that that's the point of what this session is. And given the complexity of the session and the fact that you actually have to do the body work on them and offer medicine it's not something that can be done remotely remotely no yeah yeah this is definitely an in-person face-to-face experience so are you teaching this modality currently to to people i just started trilum academy last year in 2023 um i started i started this work and i started getting sessions and it took me a while to figure it out first of all because this isn't a modality that's known you know and touching someone when they're altered is very sensitive <laughs> very sensitive and i needed to figure out you know medicines and dosing and all of that and so once i kind of figured out i was like oh this is this is something that i can offer even beyond my friends and family but like to my community um word spread like wildfire and it got to the point where like this was growing beyond me and um i had a very strong uh calling knowing uh to figure out how to teach um so i could spread this out 
you know, because this is this is something that I believe in and I have I have seen it do magical, wonderful things. And I do believe that this is a modality that can do a lot of beautiful work in the world and people need it. Our world is crazy right now. <laughs> There's, you know, countries are at war, religions are at war, cultures are at war, you know, gun violence has increased, suicides have increased, bullying has increased, politics are insane, you know, and people are doing what they want and saying what they want and taking what they want and hurting who they want. And there's just there. And those of us in the crossfires, you know, experience trauma. We just, we don't have time to do 40 years of psychotherapy and then go do multiple rounds in plant medicine and then supplement with body work, like to go see multiple practitioners, you know, to experience wholeness and well-being. You know, the state of our world is getting a little bit more intense. Um, so this is something that I can believe, you know, it's not a it's not a shortcut, but like let's let's do those therapies in one session. Let's be really efficient. Um and our and people need it. So yep, so I'm I'm teaching. So uh Trilum Academy right now is a four month online program. So self-taught with worksheets and videos with weekly check-in calls with me where I can do more teachings and, and just connection points and then um, live in-person sessions, you know, because I think the, the practitioners themselves need to experience a trilum session so they have a full understanding of what they're holding um, before they officially offer it. And so that, of course, has to be done in person. And so... You know, I'm, I'm working right now to figure out how to do that around the world, but I'm going to figure it out. And that's what I'm working on. Nice. And what are the prerequisites for someone to be able to join and study the course under you? Right now, uh, experience with psychedelics is a plus. Um, it's not required, but it's a bonus. The real requirement is um, somatic or body work massage experience. You have to be able to already know anatomy and how to approach a body safely. Because the online program, I can teach all of the theory, um, but I can't teach touch virtually. Yeah. Um, so for the online program uh, experience as a somatic body work or massage therapist, um, other than that, everything else I, I teach. And so, um, you know, I go into trauma and how that relates to the body and how something that happens when I'm five can still carry with me when I'm 43. Um, I go through the psychedelic medicines, what they are, how they work on the brain, how to properly dose, all of the contraindications. Um, I go through the specific body work technique because it is very different. Um, touching someone when they're altered, if you do your traditional technique, it can be very overwhelming, you know, as someone is is open and sensitive. And so I teach how to, how to touch them safely. Um, and then I include, you know, everything that they need to know about how to put a session together and to do this ethically, but most importantly, safely for themselves and specifically for their clients, of course. Okay. So what physical symptoms can be uh, what physical ailments can be cured through trilome? What have you noticed in your sessions? A lot of chronic pain, unexplained pain. That's my favorite. <laughs> when people come in and they tell me, you know, I have pain in my shoulder, but I've gone to all the doctors and they run all the tests and nothing is wrong. Um, that's when my ears prick up and I get really excited. <laughs> um, uh, chronic tension, chronic fatigue, um, misalignment, body misalignments. Um, those are the things that I, I tend to see that I, that I work with more frequently. And what non-physical ailments or body or conditions can you help, which, which are not physical? Trauma, PTSD complex PTSD, um, anxiety, tension, um, 
you know, it's it's interesting because we we go through this world and we have these experiences. And in those experiences, we learn lessons. And we bookmark those in our frontal lobe, you know, as a definitive, truthful thing. I'm not safe. I'm not lovable. Everyone's going to leave me. Um, I have to look a certain way. I have to behave a certain way. I have no choice. I'm a victim of my experiences. I have to fulfill obligations to other people. I don't matter. And those types of belief systems can have very physical effects. Like when you carry those belief systems, it shows up in your body. But you're not, you know, it's not obvious, right? Because it's it's part of your just belief systems as truth. And so you just filter information, you know, a thousand times a day through these filtering truths. And so, you know, like most people, like for me, for example, I wasn't walking through my life consciously thinking I'm not safe. I was just behaving as though I'm not safe. Right. And um so a large part of like what people hold in their discoveries in a trilome session are those like inner belief systems that just don't serve them anymore. Like that was something they learned, but what's their truth? What's the truth about who they are and their value? Um, and those are the the beautiful discoveries that happen when you allow yourself the time and space to do that and that's where the psychedelics come in come into place because the psychedelics start to soften that frontal lobe so that filtering system so suddenly you're processing information without those filters and so those subconscious truths come through and that's when people go oh wow it's so obvious i had no idea that that's what i was doing but now that i see it oh okay yeah i get it <laughs> It appears to me that um, psychedelics serve as a vehicle to set yourself free of belief systems, maybe which don't serve you anymore. Or even if they do serve you, you can just check, does this still serve me? Yeah. Why, why do you think there's a need at this point in time in our world for services like, like the one you're offering? I think because what I you know I mentioned before about our our world being in the crisis state that it's in, and we just don't have the time to search out multiple practitioners. And the most efficient way to reach the subconscious is through psychedelics. When you're in uh, talk therapy, which is a beautiful modality and is badly needed, so like, please continue. <laughs> but with those deeper subconscious belief systems, sometimes it's hard to. It's hard to realize what you've subconsciously assumed. And it can take years to to come to those realizations. Maybe not always with a really with a really well practiced, you know, therapist maybe sooner. Um, but the psychedelics drop you in that mode pretty quickly. And so again, you're just you're sensing your truth and you're sensing who you are and you're sensing information from a different perspective and um yeah so are there short-term benefits and or long-term benefits after a session yes could you please <laughs> give us some example <laughs> yeah short-term benefits um I often see people like their their nervous system get reset. So they come in really tight and they leave, you know, fully rested and relaxed. Um, they leave with a very clear, quick understanding about what they're holding and what their belief systems are that they've been assuming. And, you know, I tell everyone over and over and over again, like I harp this into everyone what is your truth separate and apart from stories and projections or things that you've been taught so aside from any other voice outside of your own what is your truth and um 
So they they leave with that short term benefit. Now the long term benefit, you know, is up to them, you know, to continue that work and to and to pursue that if it if it really resonates. Um, and some people can, some people don't. You know, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard work. Um, long term benefits are a deeper connection to the body. You know, a realization of of really what their bodies hold. And so people will often say. You know, I'm so sensitive now. Like when I start to contract, I can feel it quicker. And so when you feel it quicker, you can deal with it quicker, you know, instead of letting it just build and build and build. So deeper connection to self, deeper connection to their body um, would be what I've seen. Do you think psychedelics and services like trilome that you are offering um, be made accessible and available for people? I certainly hope so. And I know that there are political challenges in place that are preventing that, but the incredible therapeutic value that this brings and people being able to come off medications and to heal I would hope that our medical systems, like that would be a joint intention. And I don't believe that that's actually the case oftentimes. Um, you know, this is this is something that can truly help people and can truly heal people. And I, I would love to see this legalized. Um, you know, that being said, you know, psychedelic therapies aren't appropriate for everyone. It's not for everyone. You know, there are contraindications and there are things to be concerned about and there are things to be watchful of. Um, so I do feel like there needs to be some type of way that we can safeguard, you know, so people don't get hurt in some way. Um, you know, what that looks like, you know, I don't know, but I'm happy to work with political leaders to, to find an answer to that. Uh, but I would love to see it available to everyone. And you mentioned that you noticed people being able to get off medications after a session mm. with you. W what kind of medications and what do they treat? I will give you an example. Um, I'm sure she'll be okay with it. But so my mother... Um, my mother started to do this work with me and she has always been on high blood pressure medication. And through the session, she was realizing that she was living up to, you know, like these rules or these standards that seemed unachievable. And when she was able to let that go, suddenly without that pressure, you know, her, her blood pressure dropped. And she told me the next day, she goes, I didn't, I didn't need my blood pressure medication. You know, but that symptom was because of, you know, an external thing. You know, it wasn't just because her body, you know, wasn't able to regulate. You know, it was because of a, a you know, a belief or an external thing. Um, people that are on antidepressants, um, you know, depression, depression can be situational. And it could be, you know, there's chemical imbalances and it can be a true thing that needs to be taken very seriously. Sometimes people go into a state of depression because... You know, their their needs aren't being out in life and they're ignoring their own needs or they're in a career that they don't like. But they don't feel like they have choice. And so, of course, they're going to, you know, not feel happy and need additional support. In the cases where depression is situational and people come to a point where they're able to see their truth and make those changes to fulfill their needs and to honor their truth and to stand up for themselves you know, then suddenly the, you know, the depression just naturally resolves. So those would be two instances. So depending on, um, depending on the medication and why they're taking it. Um, yeah, use for the medications can definitely uh, be resolved and go away. I see. So you're currently in Australia and you have been here for a while. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us um, how your experience has been? 
I love it here. <laughs> it's been wonderful. It's been one of the greatest privileges of my life to be able to come all the way across the Pacific and come to another country and a group of people and um, share this work that I've been so deeply, deeply passionate about for a long time. And this is work that saved my life. And to be able to share that with other people in a different culture is just, it's a huge, huge honor. Um, everyone here has been great. It's been, I always love a good adventure anyways. And so going someplace that I've never been to, to before to see a new country and meet new people is, is always a uh, great fun, but yeah, it's been fun here. I've had, I've had a great time. I've had a wonderful host and, um, I'm so grateful that a dear friend of mine agreed to come with me. Uh, so I have a friend with me, um, who's been a godsend blessing. And so we've just had the best time together. So you given, um, you, you've been one of the incredible speakers at using plants as medicine conference. How have people received, um, received you and your offering? Mm. I was a bit taken back at the reception just because I, the first time that I spoke at your conference was the first time that I really did any type of public speaking engagement and I was jet lagged and I was really tired and, you know, I'm used to talking to people about trial and one-on-one, -on -one. like this feels very comfortable to me, but when you're standing in front of a room full of people, the energy shifts and changes dramatically. And I don't know that I was necessarily prepared for that. And so it was a way more, um, I think emotional on my share. And so in my head, of course, it was emotional disaster. Everyone hated it. Oh my goodness. What am I doing here? <laughs> um, but it turns out that I think the vulnerability, my vulnerability in that moment is actually what connected me to the audience. And um, so the feedback was that people really resonated with that and were really touched by that and by the personal stories that I was sharing in those moments. Um, and the, the flood of requests for sessions, you know, I didn't anticipate, you know, I, told my partner back home, like I, I may be home in two weeks, you know, like what if no one wants a session? Like what if this doesn't resonate with these people here? Um, and I had to call him back and say, sorry, I'm going to be gone for six. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been, it's been, um, it's really touched my heart and filled my heart in a very deep way. So will you come back? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. Of course. So how can, how can the community get in touch with you? So my website is www.trilome.com and that's T-R-I-L-O-M-E. Um, I'm working on being on the social media networks. Um, so my Instagram is Trilome Academy and my Facebook would be Lisa Parker dash Trilome Academy. And if people want to reach out, my email is lisa at trilome.com. Wonderful. Thank you. Do you have any, any last final thoughts um, that you'd like to leave, leave us with? Hmm. I would say to you, Nick, thank you for providing opportunities to have these conversations. You know, because as I said, mentioned before, there's a lot of, what I'm finding is that there's a lot of confusion. And so being able to provide opportunities for people to get trusted, sound information and connected to people, um, you know, who can answer questions and guide and direct them to safe spaces is, is really incredibly important. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for what you're doing here. And thank you for this opportunity and invitation to come and Meet your community. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It has been an absolute pleasure having you join us. Thank you for your time, and we hope to see Trilome grow and spread across the world. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>